On The Exchange, we love to cover customer retention and customer experience. And strangely enough, we've never had a guest on the show to talk about the retention tool that I find myself recommending most often, and that's email marketing. Today, we're going to focus on the importance of customer retention, how to evaluate your efforts, and specifically go over email tactics and strategies you can use to boost your customer retention. There are a ton of people out there that can speak to email marketing as an acquisition channel, but only a select few, in my opinion, that can talk at the same level about retention marketing through email. We're excited to have one of those people joining us today. Today, we have Val Geisler, email strategist, founder of Fix My Churn, and currently customer evangelist at Clavio. Welcome to the show, Val. Hey, thanks for having me. When you're thinking about retention, what's kind of that go-to North Star metric that you think these e-commerce, that e-commerce brands should be paying attention to? Because if, if someone was to go Google it, they might get CLV, they might get repeat purchase rate, they might get purchases per year. To you, what's that North Star of retention that brands should be looking at? Uh, engagement with your brand. Um, so it's a little bit of a harder data point to track. So if you want like a super hard data point that I would say uh, repeat purchase rate, that's one that you can go find right now and point to. Um, but engagement with your brand is like, how often are they uh, clicking through on emails? How much are they replying to your SMS? How, um, how many times are they uh, maybe logging into their account if they have one, if you have that functionality. Um, those kinds of like softer data points, I think are really key indicators of a customer's retention. Something we do on the SaaS side of things or that I did with clients um, back in the day was, and that I also apply whenever possible to e-commerce is, there's a kind of leading indicator that someone might be churning when they log into their dashboard, their, their account dashboard, and go to the billing page more than once in X period of time. So sometimes it's <laughs> like, go to the billing page more than, twi- more than once in 30 days, you're questioning your account. Um, like, why else would you do that? You go once maybe to update a credit card, fine, okay, good, you're still in great standing. But if you're going and looking at it, not doing anything with it, but you're clicking on that tab, why? Um, and the only logical solution is there's an indi- that's an indicator that there's a chance that they might be potentially churning. Um, so, you know, those, those kinds of things that you can look at hard, harder data points for potential to churn, but then um, that potential to retain is, in my opinion, one of those softer data points, engagement being the key there. Repeat purchase rate is definitely one, because um, obviously the more they purchase in a shorter period of time, the more likely they are to stick around. Um, there's a great brand uh, that has this really cool second purchase thank you email. So I think a lot of brands have this, you know, first purchase thank you email we send and hey, thanks for your purchase, we'd love your review. Okay, well one, (laughs) don't ask for a review before the product gets to them. Um, But two, having a, a separate new copy for a second purchase and a third purchase, um, just acknowledging that, I think that this brand just the only difference between the first purchase and the second purchase, the email says in the second one, like, thanks again for supporting us. It's that word again, like is acknowledging, I'm not getting the same email I got the first time I made a purchase. You know that I came back. And it's those little things that make all the difference. And also that's when you ask for the uh, review is on that second purchase. One thing that uh, jumps out at me when we're thinking about email and what you just mentioned on this engagement metric, it almost takes us a level higher where most brands are thinking, I got to drive to purchase. So every email tactic I need to release should drive straight to a purchase. Mm -hmm. And I think engagement, hearing you say that all of a sudden opens up my mind a bit to some other opportunities that I haven't even thought about and would love to ask you about. So do you see any specific tactics with email that are driving toward an engagement that isn't a purchase, but still puts a customer on the path to a repeat purchase or, or retention? Yeah. Uh, my favorite is uh, driving them toward disengaging temporarily. 
Oh, um, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's big. <laughs> yeah. So uh, last year, Black Friday, um, you know, it was a tough year for a lot of people. And my clients, we, with everyone I worked with, we implemented an opt out of Black Friday email uh, option. So we sent an email, we sent two of them um, that uh, offered the opportunity to opt out of Black Friday. Within oh. that email is a preview of here's what our Black Friday deals are as much as they each brand was willing to share publicly before it went out. Um, but here's what we're going to be offering. We also totally understand if you're not in a place to participate this year, or if you just simply like don't want to hear about it. If you don't want to get seven emails in three days, um, that's totally fine. And you can opt out of those emails, but stay on our email list. Um, that was the only call to action in those emails was to opt out of Black Friday specific emails. And every time we hit send, we made sales on those emails. So people would click like the logo at the top of the email and it drove revenue by offering people an opportunity to walk away for a little bit. Are you seeing brands out there putting kind of retention campaigns together where there isn't really like they're not driving them to anything at all other than like hey just reply let's have a conversation like are, are we starting to see brands do more of that starting to and what i love about this is it's not just about building relationship with your customers but it's also about building a relationship with the inbox which is something that we don't think mm -hmm. about a lot until it's a problem is deliverability of your emails um so People care about deliverability when there's a problem, but being proactive on it is really important too. Engagement with your emails is an indicator that inboxes want your emails, that subscribers want your emails, which tells inboxes, keep delivering these emails, even to people who aren't necessarily opening them every time because other people want these emails. So that means there's like a collective good happening. Uh, this is what these computers do. I'm like, uh, uh, what personifying computers right now, um, but it's kind of, it's basically like the conversation a computer has with when an email is sent is like, okay, well, lots of people have been replying to these emails and clicking on them. And this individual really hasn't recently, but it, we have all these other data pieces that say these emails are valuable. So I'm going to keep delivering these emails to this inbox, even though they're unopened most of the time. Um, so, it keeps your deliverability up to create engagement. Um, one of the most powerful things you can do from a product development standpoint, from an engagement standpoint, from an email subscription deliverability standpoint is in that very first welcome email, when you deliver your, uh, your on your promise in the opt-in, your discount code or whatever it is that you are offering, deliver on that and ask them a question. Um, ask them a question that uh, so you can ask them a question that has something to do with your product. You can also ask them a question that has nothing to do with your product. Um, so I've seen things like, uh, oh, and also this email, when you're asking, anytime you're asking a question or asking for engagement, it's ideally sent from a person and not from the brand. If every brand listening right now, if they could only do one thing with email, what would you recommend that people do to boost retention through email, that one tactic that you really think every brand should be using right now? Yeah. Uh, so I think most brands know about post-purchase emails, but there are a couple of different kinds, or post-purchase flows rather. There's a couple of different kinds. Post-purchase pre-delivery is one flow. Post-delivery is a second flow. Um, and then post, like, decent amount of product usage is another flow. So uh, typically these are all combined into one big flow uh, and they usually all of that information <laughs> happens before the product has even arrived or within a couple of days of its arrival, especially with delayed shipping times and all of that that we've seen. Um, that post-purchase pre-delivery, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people rely on transactional emails to get the job done in that time period. I don't want to bother them. They're, they're, they're getting the transactional emails. That's enough. We probably even have some SMS going out. It's too much. I don't want to be too much with the messaging. 
transactional emails are different and your customers know that they're different. You are bothering them if you're just throwing them on a sale email list or um, making asks of them after they've just given you their money and they don't have the product in hand. You are not bothering them if you're educating them and you're helping them get ready for your product to arrive. So the example I like to share is from Brooklyn and Brooklyn and sell sheets. That is not something that someone's buying every single month. So, uh, however, there's a case to be made for seasonal sheets or um, like every, so they could be by season, you could change out the type of sheets you have. You could have a subscription. Um, you could have annual, like your sheets get used a lot, washed a lot. Um, so they could have a subscription, but their post-purchase pre-delivery, they do a lot of education around, hey, when you get your sheets home, you should wash them. And if you want them to be super soft, here's exactly how you should wash them. And so that way you can go like, I don't know, if you need to throw a cup of vinegar in the wash or something, you can make sure you have that in your house before the product gets to you. Um, here's something you should expect when you take them out of their package. This is what, you know, some people have mentioned there's an odor. That's fine because you're going to wash them anyways. Uh, you know, those kinds of things. Now, Val, this has been an amazing conversation. You've given our listeners a ton of tactical tips. A couple, a couple things I was not thinking you would say, some amazing gems in here. If people want to continue the conversation, where can, where can our brands follow along with you? Twitter, LinkedIn, a blog? Yeah, I check my LinkedIn like once a year. So if you, <laughs> uh, if you request me on LinkedIn, please don't be offended if I never reply. Um, but I am on Twitter a lot. So at love Val Geisler on Twitter, uh, come talk to me there. Tell me that you listen to the show. I, you know, I love hearing that and what you got from it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I'm a open book, like we can talk about anything. So happy to come back on the show, happy to have conversations on Twitter. Um, happy to annually check in on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to talk to people who are listening and want to know more. I can almost guarantee that some brands will be reaching out to you um, after listening to you here with all the insight that you gave. And uh, I'm still waiting for you to accept my LinkedIn request. And now I know why. So <laughs> yes. it's well, not Val, personal. It's, been... it's everybody. <laughs> Good to know. Fantastic conversation today. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. 